Good evening. I'm Ann Lazar, the Executive Director of the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation. I want to share a very warm welcome with everyone who is here, and thank you so much for attending. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our panels and speakers for sharing their time and expertise with everyone this evening, and we're so very pleased to have you here with us. And most of all, a thank you to Richard Driehaus for supporting this symposium. For 32 years, I've had the privilege of knowing Richard, and during that time, his generous and unwavering support toward the built environment and architecture, both in Chicago and around the world, including this beautiful Murphy Auditorium, has been, unri has been unrivaled and has touched the lives of countless people. On behalf of many, thank you so very much, Richard. For those of you who are unfamiliar with its work, the Driehaus Foundation was established in 1992. During its four decades of grant making, it has supported organizations with over $100 million in four program areas, the largest of which supports the built environment and has a focus on architecture and historic preservation. Tonight, we gather together in this glorious space that celebrates the genius of Benjamin Marshall, its grand scale and well-preserved interior and exterior are examples of Marshall at his theatrical best. The symposium will explore questions addressing what determines our attraction to some forms of architecture, such as this, over others. Recent studies integrating the fields of cognitive neuroscience and architecture point to the fact that our response to seemingly lifeless buildings is profound and undeniable. Design impacts our senses, triggers our emotions, and can affect how we work and feel. The way that a building looks from the outside can also come into play when determining how we respond to it emotionally. We will ask if today's architectural designs consider how the mind and emotions relate to buildings, space, and the urban areas that so profoundly impact people's lives, or are they sometimes more about spectacle? Our distinguished panel will discuss how these topics intersect and how the answers may be a guide for including human consideration in future development of our built environment. Before we begin, right now, it is my distinct honor to introduce Mr. Richard Driehaus. Thank you, Anne. Good evening. Identifying, encouraging, and celebrating a sense of place has been the guiding force of my philanthropy for over two decades. Place suggests that a particular spot is like no other that is endowed with qualities that make it more than a mere location. Too many places today are devoid of uniqueness that lends itself to memory. Each year, we move closer to living in a world where an American author, Gertrude Stein, famously wrote, there is no there, there. The personalization of public architecture has undermined our ability to feel connected. A growing body of scientific evidence demonstrate that a sense of place matters to our emotional, 
and physical well-being. It shows feeling part of a continuum is necessary for psychological health. How we respond to the built environment is a complex, biological, multi-sensory experience. While we attempt to better understand these mysteries, Let us repair and respect historic context. Let us then look for ways to improve the human condition. Let us not make the mistake of rendering our cities soulless. Let us ensure that place has meaning for centuries to come. Let us preserve cultural heritage across the globe so that future generations will be comforted by their surroundings and understand their identity. It is now my pleasure to begin this evening's program. Please help, it's now my pleasure, and please help welcome Frederick Marx, President of the American Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. Thank you. Well, also good evening and special thanks to Richard. Uh, That applause that I heard earlier is well deserved. For someone who's coming into Chicago, not all that frequently. Uh, It's such a pleasure to see how sophisticated everyone looks compared to Southern California. (laughs) The idea that architecture influences behavior is not new. The Greek moralists that included Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, believe that logic and order, rationality and dignity were ingredients for living well and achieving happiness. The architecture of that time played an important role in expressing that philosophy by relying on mathematics to determine precise calculations for a building's height, width, and other characteristics for an optimum visual effect. Western tradition has for centuries embraced these classical principles even as building styles have changed. From the beginning, ornament has been used as the language through which architecture has communicated with the broader public, representing the measured statistics of the natural world, the beliefs associated with religion, and the conventions of civic life. From a scientific perspective, the built environment should optimize to neural constraints on sensory performance and information-seeking behavior. It should appropriately respond to our preferences for familiarity and novelty as this relates to our past experiences. Current research on the brain, mind, body connection, and advancements in technology are pushing the boundaries for which designers must be responsible relative to the urban landscape and the occupied built structure. The Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture was formed in 2003 with financial support from the National American Institute of Architects to provide awareness of this trend and support knowledge 
that would bridge different disciplines. Through its international conferences, workshops, and interfaces lectures, the organization has reached a wide audience and has observed an ever-increasing interest among its constituency in academia and private practice to study how building form and the space in between may impact human behavior in a positive and equitable manner. In recent years, Nobel Prizes have been awarded in physiology or medicine for discoveries of place cells that influence our navigation and of molecular mechanisms that control our circadian rhythm. Our objective tonight is not to present these findings in detail, but to address a more familiar ground that applies to aesthetic judgments and their possible impact on our comfort and health. With that, I'd like to introduce Cynthia Franis Olson, who is an architect like myself, an educator, and most importantly, the director of the Mies van der Rohe Society here in Chicago. Cynthia. Thank you, Fred. What's so special about the Parthenon? I'm of Greek descent, and I'm always amazed at the effect this structure has on people. One flight back to Chicago from Athens had me seated next to an Argentinian gentleman. Making polite conversation, I asked him what, what he had visited in Greece. His eyes became wet, and he said, the Parthenon and the Acropolis. I was astonished. I asked him what he knew about Greek history. He replied, I Elines in afti pusimetechun stin eliniki ekpedefsi. Greeks are the ones who partake of Greek education. There's no doubt that knowledge of the language makes a remarkable difference. I realize now, though, that the vocabulary of architecture is something that extends a historical and cultural richness beyond language. This vocabulary reflects ideas that were conceived in ancient times. The Mies Society at IIT is about ideas and buildings that serve the broader goals of society. Being the director of the Mies Society, I should follow their philosophy and get right to the point. I strongly believe that the Parthenon's values, classical beauty, proportion, symmetry, have been inherited by all of us. I recognize these qualities as important in classical architecture and see how Mies utilized them in his architecture. The two structures that we are using as case studies tonight are varied, different geographical settings, different different geological conditions, different light, opacities, functions, materials, not to mention one is handmade and one is machine-made. Still, for me, they share many common characteristics employed through balance, proportion, rhythm, repetition, texture, producing simplicity, lucidity, and harmony, all on a human scale. There's a mathematical clarity and precision in both, together with openness and freedom, the dialogue of Athenian democracy. Both the Parthenon and Crown Hall, in my opinion, are integrated wholes. While some contemporary buildings try to incorporate the most impressive of their features, many lack the underlying principles and discipline that create the life of the whole. Architecture expresses underlying ideas, and buildings convey meanings. It's my great pleasure to introduce Stuart Cohen. Stuart is a practicing architect, educator, and author. 
Um, he's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and is Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois Chicago. He's authored books, he has won numerous awards, and is the partner in the firm Cohen Hacker Architects. Um, and in my opinion, and in the opinion of many, they're one of the most highly acclaimed residential practices in the last 40 years. He's also taught at um, Harvard, Columbia, Penn, and Notre Dame, and uh, studied under Colin Rowe at Cornell University. Stuart? I assume I'm supposed to speak into this, even though I might. Cynthia, thank you for the lovely introduction, and thank you and Anne and, of course, Richard for organizing this uh, symposium on a topic which clearly is of interest to lots and lots of people who are here tonight. Um, I put together a bunch of comments. I don't think of myself as any kind of uh, expert or even somebody who's overly well informed in this area. Having said that, uh, a recent presidential candidate recently commented that he would stay on script, otherwise he might go on way too long. I've been asked to speak for only 10 minutes, so I will stay on script reading my comments. Although the topic certainly is one that invites digression, as well as it certainly for me raising lots of questions. So we all know the Winston Churchill quote, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. We know that oppressive environments have been correlated to antisocial behavior, that academic performance improves in classrooms filled with natural light, and that walking in the woods can lower our blood pressure. We acknowledge that there's a link between architecture and behavior, but how directly can we correlate this to our design decisions as architects? Uh, we, as architects, we can create spaces that influence our physical movement, propelling us forward, turning us in space, and bringing us to a stop. We can also create spaces that make us feel emotions, such as delight, awe, dread, and anxiety. Can architecture create motions that cause us to act in certain predictable ways? Why do some spaces such as churches and libraries cause us to speak in hushed tones? Is this a function of the architecture or is it behavior based on learned cultural expectations? Acknowledging that all architecture is experiential and that great architecture can certainly evoke strong emotions, we should ask about the connection between how we feel about our environment and how we act as a result of it. Assuming that architecture can have an effect on human behavior is certainly not a new idea. Uh, as uh, Frederick pointed out, but the example that comes to mind, uh, for me at least, is Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon which was an 18th century model debtor's prison that placed the jailer and his family at the center of a circle of jail cells. There they were on full view, modeling moral and ethical behavior for the prisoners. This had no documented effect, as best I know. However, I think it's a short leap from Bentham's panopticon to the early 20th century modernist belief that architecture could change the world. With respect to modern architecture, some time ago it occurred to me that, 20th century, that, that in the 20th century, the first generation of modernist architects were self-taught, all having studied under the Beaux-Arts. By the 1970s, architects who chose to build traditional classical architecture had been taught modernism in school and therefore were also self-taught. They could be thought of, or we could be thought of, as graduates of modern architecture. Uh, here I'm borrowing the expression from Bernard Berenson, the famous art historian who referred to himself as a graduate of Christianity. Berenson, 
who had converted to Christianity became an agnostic and explained that while he still admired the form, he could no longer believe in the dogma. So among the rejected dogma of modern architecture was the belief that buildings could directly affect social change, creating a better world, as well as the idea that buildings form that building form is a direct result of function or structure. For me, as a young architect, I could no longer believe in an architecture of abstraction, making buildings which were only compositions of points, lines, and planes devoid of any intended meaning. Of course, the buildings of the, icon of the heroic period of modern architecture would come to represent, by association, the importance of 20th century technology, and at first, progressive socialism, and later in America, capitalist and corporate values. Perhaps this is because of one of the constants of the human mind, that we, and that is that we are always seeking to assign meaning to objects as well as to events. A thing's meaning is a function of associative memory and it's modern neuroscience through the use of functional magnetic resonance imaging that has established that memory is at work in all of our cognitive processes, including the process of creating things. Examples of associative meaning in architecture would be early 20th century banks that were Doric temples as an intended way to signify their purpose. The Doric order was seen as the strongest, sturdiest, and most permanent. Thus, banks in the form of Doric temples could signify that the bank was a stable institution and that the money deposited there would be safe. The forms of the church have had their own etymology based not only on liturgy and the relationship of the congregant to the priest, but more importantly based on our imagined physical relationship to God. Spaces experienced as sacred are usually vertical spaces because they connect the congregate to a God we believe to be somewhere in the sky. This is a format that works for classical dome churches, for Gothic churches, and for dome government buildings which originally signified the application of God's laws to man. The other constant of the human mind is identifying and creating order. So perhaps we can draw some conclusions, not about architectural style, but about the need for order, comfort, and familiarity in our environments. We should argue for architecture in cities made legible through ideas about memory and visual order, asking how such architecture affects how we feel, how we act, and how we conceive our relationship to society. Architects love to turn to other disciplines to reinforce and give credibility to what they believe. Over the years, certain books have been taken up by architects, added to student reading lists, and frequently referred to. I'm surprised that the philosopher Alain de Bouton's 2006 book, The Architecture of Happiness, has not been discovered by our profession. De Bouton writes about the relationship of architecture to the environment, society, and to human behavior expressing these ideas far better than I can. Here is de Bouton writing about the role of both memory and order in architecture. Quote, insofar as buildings speak to us, they also do so through quotation, that is by referring to and triggering memories of the context in which we have previously seen them. They communicate by prompting associations to such legendary positives as friendliness, kindness, subtlety, strength, and intelligence. Our sense of beauty and our understanding of the nature of a good life are intertwined. We seek association of peace in our bedrooms, metaphors for generosity and humanity and harmony in our chairs. We can be moved by a column that meets a roof with grace, by worn steps that hint at wisdom and by Georgian doorways that demonstrate the playfulness and courtesy in its fan light windows. The Parisian street moves us because we recognize how sharply its qualities contrast with those which generally color our lives. We call it beautiful from a humbling 
over-familiarity with its antithesis in domestic life petty disputes and in architecture streets whose elements decide to pay no heed to the appearance of their neighbors and instead cry out chaotically for attention. He continues, the street presents an impression of beauty tied to qualities of regularity and uniformity, inviting the conclusion that at the heart of a certain kind of architectural greatness, there lies the concept of order. We require constancy in our buildings for we ourselves frequently close to disori are frequently close to disorientation and frenzy. We require that our environments act as guardians of calmness and direction on which we have a precarious hold. And to conclude in my own words, I would ask, are today's wildly articulated buildings which gyrate and seem to defy gravity a reflection of the of the chaos, impermanence, and uncertainty that have come to characterize our contemporary society. Perhaps we intuitively know the answer to this question from the behavior that's continually reported on the nightly news. If so, the question then is, should we be making environments which contribute to this instability and anxiety? Or can we, using knowledge which is emerging and things we have long known anecdotally create more humane architectural environments. Thank you. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, Eric Lasher, who I've known for many years and who I think is probably one of the finest architectural designers in the city of Chicago. Eric is president and director of design at HBRA. Um, he has an interesting backstory. He was trained as an architect at Cornell University worked as an architect for a while, and then went to Hollywood to become a set designer. Uh, I sort of lost track of Eric's career, but if, I hope I'm not going on too long. Julian, I went to see a really bad Robin William movies, movie called What Things May Come, and halfway through the movie there is a scene which is set in a, in a replica of C.N. Ledoux's design for an addition to the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And one immediately knows that in all the books arrayed around the room are the stories of everyone's life. Uh, we were stunned by the appearance of that image in a movie and actually sat through every single one of the credits wanting to know who the set designer was. Well, the set designer was Eric Lasher and having said probably too much already, I'm going to turn the podium over to him. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. That was one of many anecdotes from my life in the screen trade. <laughs> Well, I come to this subject with little knowledge of the neuroscientific perspective on architecture. But I do have considerable experience as an artist who has spent the better part of my lifetime considering the affective properties of admired buildings and places in order to understand the source of their ineffable power to inspire and to accommodate human behavior. Throughout my life in architecture, I've pondered basic questions on the matter of buildings and their perception. My conclusions are more anecdotal than scholarly, but relevant to our discussion, I hope. What makes the experience of a building memorable or extraordinary? Uh, many of you, I presume, are not architects. I think it's important to mention that as part of their education, architects are taught, if not inculcated, with a canon of esteemed models, uh, works venerated for a variety of reasons. Some are there for reasons specific and academic, subject to change with shifts of artistic currents and the prejudices of prevailing philosophies, while others are more universal, retaining their allure and persisting as exemplars over long periods of time. Architecture and its experience are informed by innumerable layers some fundamental and related to the human body and its sensory potential, uh, others cultural and subjective, temporal or associative. 
I find that great works demonstrate a mastery of many aspects of this spectrum. The best speak in some way to all. Why are some buildings arresting, projecting a familiarity or a power in the first moments of encounter, taking a place in the visitor's consciousness like that of human countenance or of a mountain of singular profile, while others remain mute or inert? Some buildings elicit emotional responses, possessing an innate capacity to be intuitively understood, while others have an unfolding character that is equally irresistible and compelling. I don't know that a fully rationalized set of principles can ever unlock these mysteries or produce a path to perfection, uh, despite the wishes and belief of generations of architects and theorists. Architecture strata are too complex, but considered in isolation, individual factors can be illuminating. I find there are some fundamental aspects and qualities that are almost always present in the most admired works of architecture many of which can be considered to varying degrees classical, meaning generally ordered through metrical means such as planning grids and consistent proportional relationships comprised of a set of parts or elements that conform to conventions applied throughout and relational rules for structural elements, decorative or ornamental systems, and architectural components such as doors or windows that are part of this taxonomy. The visual languages that we've traditionally identified as classical were developed in antiquity in the Mediterranean region through a process of construction, abstraction of that construction, and conventionalization of elements. This visual language became adequately self-sufficient to be disengaged from its original constructional origins, programmatic function, and cultural associations, and was eventually adapted and incorporated into all manner of building types, scales, uses, and ways of building not present at the genesis of the language. Classical grammars emerged independently in other parts of the world, but all share origins in construction and a certain overarching tendency to order and totalizing relationships. Before our innate affections are hijacked by learned notions or the strictures of taste, we can approach great buildings as innocents and see them without intervening prejudice. They announce an inherent sense of order. This might be found in their geometry, proportions, or relationships of elements to one another. These qualities need not be imitative of creatures or structures found in nature, but often share the balance and orderly arrangements found in natural forms such as the human face or body, seeds, blossoms, or crystalline structures. These command attention and offer basic clues to their organizational and aesthetic principles. Symmetry or grouped symmetries, shape relationships, and balance command our attention and are intuitively perceived. As is evident in bodies that possess major and minor elements, many natural structures are hierarchical, as are classical buildings. Works of architecture possessing these qualities might be singular objects, such as the Parthenon, a domed structure, or more locally, uh, Mises Crown Hall. Other more complex examples are found in the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, where informal compositions are undergirded with complex relational geometries, integrated formal and material systems, and proportional order centerings and recenterings. In contrast, some buildings convey a presence more akin to a landscape or an indelible vista a composition of unrelated elements that together achieve a unity, balance, and visual wholeness that gives pause and explains an overarching, albeit non-classical, sense of order. The work of modern architects, including Le Corbusier, Alvar Aalto, or to some extent H.H. H. Richardson, achieve memorability through compositional means. Many of the greatest works harness both. Wright, already mentioned, is joined by Mies, whose Lakeshore Drive apartments achieve a dynamic, ever-unfolding energy through the nuanced and asymmetric juxtaposition of objects, in this case the prisms of the paired towers, which are in and of themselves as balanced, symmetrical, and complete in their totalizing rigor as Greek temples. The ensemble derives power from tensions and affinities between the regular and picturesque. Conversely, ensembles that evolve over time through accretion and subtraction 
sometimes attain remarkable singularity through the contributions of multiple authors and historical accident. Consider the Acropolis or the Mont Saint-Michel. Architectural experiences to be had within buildings and design spaces are also varied and innumerable. The interior of the Pantheon focuses our attention inward and upward. Its acoustic properties lead most to stop and admire, which are desired characteristics both of its original purpose to memorialize greatness, its later use as a place of worship, and its present role as testament to the genius and universality of Roman architecture. Other spaces might convey a sense of comfort and repose through configuration, materiality, scale, or prospect. Examples include Falling Water and the Farnsworth House. Design for public buildings often strives for a dual nature. Presence amidst the chaos or unremarkability of a city or landscape that distinguishes it from them, and when entered, conjures the behaviors and feelings appropriate to assign purpose, which might include conviviality, reverence, or another sense. Effective works of architecture persuade us. The best examples suggest their use through appearance and character, manipulation of light and space to explain their organization. What leads one forward or aside? Is it signage or is it something more intuitively grasped? They are all to some degree legible, meaning they can be read or understood in their organization, status, or intended patterns of use. Some are so potent as images that they assume an iconic status even amongst those who have never actually experienced them. Resisting our current tendency to give media priority over actual experience, I am more inclined to favor physical experience over the image, but my visits to buildings that I first became familiar with through representation have revealed great surprises of depth and understanding that nevertheless rarely diminish the representative figure its potency and its memory. I'm taking a risk admitting this here, it's a little bit weird and personal, but there are some buildings that I find so compelling that I can nearly feel their organization within my body. They appear to invite me to imagine occupying or becoming them as if they could be my own corporeal being. I might be alone in this, but it is part of an imaginative process that the most compelling, bu compelling buildings have always evoked for me. So what comprises greatness? A multitude of buildings need only announce a place to enter, serve as good neighbors, deferring to their surroundings and providing the qualities that their host culture deems essential or appropriate to their needs, wishes, or the status of its owners. Propriety. These are noble and essential characteristics that can be elusive and might be achieved through the same means used in great buildings. These comprise most of our built environment and are no less important than our monuments or icons, but they do not burn in the memories of multitudes. What about the buildings that truly resonate, pull, command, welcome our affections? Many possess a classical sense of order. Parts, whether constructional or ornamental, speak of a complete entity. They convey to all a sense of rightness, relating the small to the immense, and each of their constituent elements are at once inseparable and essential. Places or buildings might invite us into a world within that gives fulfillment to our thoughts about their out outward character, or instead reveal or additional or contrary characteristics that can further astonish. Whether these take on aspects of a mandala or a landscape, we remember these buildings with joy, fondness, or a sense of awe. But it's impossible to ignore the subjective aspects of architecture. A building commonly perceived as classical in its ordering of space and form will manifest differently in Kyoto, Athens, Jaipur, or Chicago. Their profiles, elements, silhouettes, and conventions are not invented anew with each building, but instead undergo subtle variations and refinements over time. Classical buildings can be familiar and inventive at the same time and have a depth and eloquence characteristic of a mature language. Classical principles applied abstractly without the fullness of evolved expression usually produce denatured, clumsy works that fail to inspire. But there are some exceptions. The modern classicism of Mies van der Rohe emerged from his familiarity with pre-modern methods, and he evolved a language almost immediately complete well-suited to the material culture and spirit 
of 20th century modernity and an answer to what was seen by many as an aesthetic exhaustion brought on by the indiscriminate application of historic motif. Culture, resources, and circumstances shape the expression of fundamental forms and typologies. These subjectivities are arbitrary as human language, shaped as well, by our, as, well as shaping our cultures and our perception. At their core, they are related, but their individual realization shows other things. In the end, I don't know that the objective and subjective can ever be decoupled. As greatness emerges from an ineffable brew of habit, refinement, primality, and mystery, I do think that the persistence of the classical, whether narrowly or broadly defined, an examination of its fundamental aspects might offer evidence or clues as to how we most deeply respond to our built environment. Our most esteemed works of architecture, though few in number, because of their clarity of focus and broadly acknowledged capacity to awaken and influence, can serve as foundational examples to be mined for our understanding, yielding principles to be harnessed and deployed in our most venerable as well as our more uh, humble and conventional architectural enterprises. I'm going to now introduce our moderator, Kevin Harrington, uh, a great friend and one of the brilliant minds of his discipline of the history of architecture. He has taught uh, with, uh, with sage gravity and levity at a number of institutions, both here and abroad. He is currently teaching at the Illinois Institute of Technology, and uh, he is also Remarkably, a graduate of Cornell, just like Stuart and I. I don't know if there is a pattern there, but uh, I am delighted and honored to be part of a panel under his guidance, direction, or influence. Kevin. Thank you, Eric. First of all, I'd like to introduce the other uh, members of the panel. Next to me is Patricia Norman, who is a psychiatrist in practice in Chicago and also on the faculty of the Rush University Medical School on the near west side. Uh, between Stuart and Eric is Ulrika Segerstrala, a sociologist who uh, taught with me at IIT for many years. Uh, she, a few years ago, received a Guggenheim Fellowship and. I uh, had the great pleasure of being able to go to Italy and stay in the Rockefeller Center, which is, gave her quite wonderful views of the Italian landscape. Before I ask Patricia and uh, Ulica to respond to both what Stuart and Eric have said, I'd like to make a couple observations of, of my own. First of all, I'd ask you, how many of you have been to the Parthenon? either in Athens or in Nashville, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so about half the room. And how, yes. have, how many of you have been to Crown Hall? Uh, most of the more. room, I, I, I think yeah. it's fair to say. So, but I think it's probably fair to say that of all the buildings in the Western world, the Parthenon is at the top. Those of us who have never been there may never have been there, still have an idea of what the building is about. And we've talked about memory several times today, and landscape or environment or place have come up several times uh, today. And in every case, memory seems to be the element that makes these things work. So for many of us who may not have been to either Crown Hall or the Parthenon, we have some idea about them. What I think is important to consider when we think about these, both of these buildings, which are highly ordered, very structured, very purposeful in their character, is that each of them was designed to be first seen, not in some kind of frontal way. You don't walk up to the Parthenon by looking at the east front, the tympanum, which of course is the back door. In fact, you, enter the, you see the Parthenon first on the hill above the city, then as you wind your way up the hill and enter the Acropolis, there you see the Parthenon in three-quarter view. In other words, you see it as a body. And that idea of buildings as bodies 
is an idea that runs through almost all of the Western tradition in architecture, the building as a body. And I think that's part of what allows people like Eric to say, a building I care for, I embody. It becomes part of me. And it's this interaction, I think, between what we see and what we experience and what we recall that opens up this possibility of having a better insight into how these things actually work. Now, none of us are going to be able to lay that out in terms of precise neuronal uh, behavior, but I think all of us recognize that this exists, that there is, we happen to be corporeal things made up of lots of cells. Obviously, there is something going on at a deep biologic level that allows us to place ourselves in the world. And again, this idea of finding a place for ourselves. With that said, let me begin by asking Patricia if she would um, to talk a little bit about something she told me about a little bit earlier. And that is the idea I'm sorry, here we go. No. I can just go over all my ideas <laughs> no. again. Um, would, uh, let me ask, um, uh, uh, Patri- instead of trying to find my notes, um, Patricia, would you, um, t- two things. One, would you, if you wish, respond to what either Stuart or Eric have said and the ways in which they can make the panel work? And also, you talked about um, mental systems, the idea that there's an executive function, Mm -hmm. there's a kind of background function that doesn't pay too much attention, and then there's a function that kind of puts all of our experiences together, um, which it seems to me might be a way in to see, to understand how it is that we make a relationship with an architectural space or any space uh, work. Um, Well, so so first, I, I might make some comments on um, some of the wonderful things that, that people have said. Um, I, I spend all of my, most of my time dealing with interiors of people, their minds, um, and um, the, lo- the lives they lead on a very um, day-to-day basis. Um, it's so interesting for me to be uh, with, with a, a bunch of architects because it's, all, it's a very different way of thinking um, for me. Um, when we talk about design and proportion and order, um, I, I understand for myself what that means. When you look at the Parthenon, it's, it's amazing. But it feels like there's often um, a divide between when we're talking about um, design and proportion of the outside or the inside, and the way it feels for people to live in a space. Because it seems to me that um, there are a number of places that are spectacular to look at and even to stand in from the inside. Um, When I was visiting Cynthia at IIT, we were looking at some models that were spectacular models um, visually. But I kept wondering, what is it like? What would it be like to live in these spaces? Um, because they're not always the same vocabulary, um, you know, mathematic, mathematical grids and proportions. Uh, we don't really know what that's like emotionally for people um, on the inside. Um, I also think. Um, we talk a lot about neuroscience and um, perception and cognition, and I know a, a lot of a lot of neuroscientists um, spend a lot of time on perception and cognition, and they particularly look at what it, what happens in different areas of the pra- of the brain, where does you know light uh, impinge on the brain and so forth. Um, <laughs> I hate to confess this, but there is still, we know so little about the brain. Um, Even things like, you know, what's responsible for something becoming conscious instead of unconscious? We have no idea. 
I mean, there, some people will write about certain systems, but really we have no idea. We also know there are certain areas of the brain that are involved with emotion, but we can't really say this is where happiness is, this is where sadness is. Um, our knowledge of the brain is, is really in its infancy. Um, so when I was looking at a lot of the, the work that's been done in the area of neuroscience and architecture, um, a lot of it talked about specific areas of the brain. And um, what, what uh, Kevin was alluding to was that now uh, neurophysiologists are starting to have a new way of looking at the brain. Rather than looking at discre discrete anatomical areas, they're starting to think in terms of networks, um, partially because we now have the technology to be able to do this. Um, so we have the executive network that tells you what to do and how to execute uh, any given behavior. Uh, then there's the default mode, which is the kind of resting state of the brain, kind of daydreaming, which is actually where we spend most of our time. And then there's the salience network, uh, which is kind of you know, the guard dog in between the two. Um, and I wondered if there was a way to look at these effects in, in a more global way, um, not just you know, uh, what this area does or when, um, you know, when light, nat when we use natural light, uh, it makes people feel better, things like that. But we don't really know on a global scale. We don't know a lot about how do we examine the felt sense of being inside of a building. And um, uh, part of this, part of what I'm saying, oh, sorry, part of what I'm saying comes from some of my own experiences being in um, psychiatric facilities where I've spent a, a large part or uh, most of my professional life. Um, and um, very early on, I was in Boston and spent a lot of time in the Eric Lindemann Center. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that center, but it's, it is an example of brutalist, or what they call brutalist architecture, with undulating uh, concrete stairways that don't go anywhere. Um, and it was a building that housed uh, people who are psychotic. And, and that was very uh, startling to me. So thinking more about the end users of places um, is, is part of what I wanted to remark on. And of course, there's a whole history of trying to build facilities for people who are disturbed in some way. So the penitentiary uh, or the asylum uh, are, and there are examples of them still in the landscape where you can see someone saying, well, this is how people behave. Let's build a, build a building that responds to that. And then in most cases, that hasn't worked out very well. Ulika, I'd like to ask you again, if you'd like to comment on what either Stuart or Eric said, but also we were talking about um, three writers who are, think about the way people act in space. Uh, one of them, Edward Hall, who uh, was at IIT and Northwestern, who wrote The Hidden Dimension. One is Kevin Lynch, who taught at MIT, who uh, wrote about the image of the city and how people respond to the city. Uh, and the third is William H. White, a, a sociologist who for people, I think in my trade, uh, is best known for the analysis he did of the Seagram Building and its plaza in New York City and watched how people actually related to a uh, place in New York rather than positing an idea about it and then asserting it uh, without actually making observations. Yes, uh, <laughs> this is a tall order, but I'm very happy to talk about this. Uh, I find the acoustic here rather bad, so I did not hear exactly what everybody was saying, but uh, I, I mean all of it. But I think I am addressing issues that you uh, talked about, and also what Mr. Dri uh, Driehaus was uh, talking about, sense of place, very important aspect, and the sense of order and orientation that comes, comes with that. Um, so, um, and the other issues are uh, the emotions one feels in particular places. So I think I'm addressing everything because I'm talking about authors who have actually have addressed it and not only uh, written about it, but also uh, done uh, uh, extensive research. And I think uh, totally path-breaking research. I am teaching at Illinois Institute of Technology. I'm a sociologist 
but I have adapted part of what I am doing to what the needs, my perceived needs of my of the students, which is and when it, I teach uh, scientists and engineers also, uh, sociology of science uh, uh, and how the whole thing works. But uh, for architects, I felt that they are wonderful and creative and very intelligent people, but I felt that they need to have another perspective on what they are doing, like an outside perspective or the man in the street or woman in the street, street perspective, which they lose very soon when they are trained. So I saw myself as a, I saw myself as a kind of guerrilla uh, leader, and I think I have had some small successes there. Uh, okay, so what, what I, I did, did then, uh, and this was long before we had the present uh, idea of neuroscience, which I have welcomed very much, of course, uh, and which I will start incorporating now in my higher high level courses as a kind of answer. But of course, it is a, a relatively reductionist answer. So uh, uh, I have been looking at various ways of perceiving uh, the environment, and particularly the correlation between, what, between people's subjective feeling, let's say, of awe or of love for architecture or for feeling of comfort or discomfort, and then what is actually there, the kind of subjective-objective relationship. Uh, uh, and I, uh, as a former chemist and natural scientist, I think this has to be found. And, uh, and I want people to be happy with their environment and I want to find the conditions under which they can be happy and architects are very important for that. And city planning is very important. So we have these three uh, authors. Uh, Edward Hall uh, is an absolutely eye-opening book. Everybody who has read it uh, says that and it is half a century old, okay? He was teaching at Illinois Tech, he was actually a uh, uh, in, into linguistics and anthropo anthropological linguist or linguistic anthropologist or something like this. But what he did when he was at IIT was to uh, write about proxemics. Proxemics was a, a discipline that he invented which had to do with the distances between people and the distances, uh, the spaces between all kinds of arrangements and so on and how it affects people's behavior. And boy, does it affect people's behavior. Also voice, I mean, this voice is my public voice perhaps, but some people in my position here would be, my students in class would be whispering, and I said, speak up, you are in, the pu in public. So we have a, a, a certain sense also, there should be a correct sense of, of, of voice and space, but I think we are losing that today. Earlier on, people took rhetoric in universities and they spoke well. Okay, anyway, so he, uh, he, in, uh, he was investi investigating this uh, stage, and he was the one who came up with the idea that we all go around with a personal bubble, which we don't want violated. So if people come into our bubble, which is as big as you can kind of maybe just sketch this way, we, we, we pull back. This is a little different in different cultures, and some People from other cultures may come into our bubble and we step, take a step back and they think we are unfriendly, but that's a different story. He also studied culture. The big thing that he came up with was we perceive space with all our senses and we can actually therefore, we should actually therefore also incorporate the possibility of, 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 of this, uh, uh, people having this, this, these feelings in architecture. And he goes through meticulously examples of this. He talks about uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, 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 tricks in the old Imperial Hotel in Japan, where he was interspersing uh, rough material with smooth material, so that people, when they saw that, almost felt like putting their hand there, but they didn't do that, but they got this kind of engagement. And today we know that all these things can be called things like affordance, or it could be something having to do with mirror neurons, if we see ourselves perhaps as being in nonverbal communication with the environment. Uh, 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 or maybe there is some kind of motoric, I know there is some kind of motoric neurons that get activated because we feel that we can go and touch it, but actually we don't go and touch it. It's some kind of little uh, internal uh, thing going on here in the brain. Anyway, it's exciting to have, to have uh, to have textural uh, uh, aspects. Uh, and we look at all kinds of other aspects. And if they are incorporated, and the more of these different senses we can activate, the more the happier we get. So 
uh, kinesthetic sense is activated uh, when we drive or when we sail or something. And uh, happy places and good places are places where actually uh, all these things can be activated because humans, I think the basic theory of all is that humans are active, uh, peop uh, active uh, individuals and need to be stimulated and not bored. Okay, uh, that's a very important. Uh, many other things. It's a, it's a lovely book called The Hidden Dimension, which is reprinted and reprinted and reprinted. Uh, Kevin uh, Lynch, not uh, Kevin here. Kevin Lynch uh, was a city planner uh, at IIT, uh, no, at MIT, and he uh, he asked himself, "What is a sense of place?" It's extremely important to have a sense of place. It has to do with your in, your personal identity, but also it has to do with your memory of places and which which you need to have and your orientation. Uh, and he, to find out this, he was doing exactly this that uh, as maybe a sociologist would have done. Uh, you go and find out what people consider good places or good cities and why they, and then he tries to figure out, and then he has them, I'm sorry, then he has them, uh, the people describe uh, various aspects of the cities and he finds various tools of kind of testing their, or, or getting information about what they find and then he puts it all together, and it's a little like Darwin sorting finches, uh, like what goes together, what are the, and he finds categories. What is it that they are looking for? He comes up with a brilliant answer. People are looking for uh, a property of the city that he calls imagibility. Something, the city should have elements that stick out so that people can remember them. Uh, and what are these elements that everybody seems to be chasing in their various answers? This is really, a, a, I think, a masterpiece of research. He says there are five elements. You have to know that, some, that there is some kind of district, he calls it. Okay. And it has to have an edge. Where is the edge? Where does it stop? Okay. Where can you get through? Where are, where are the paths? Where do they cross each other? Where are their nodes? And then where are their ways that will help you find your way, landmarks. Now, if you think about this in an open area, and he was studying also anthropology to get to this point, how do people orient themselves in, in, in deserts? How do they orient themselves in open sea and so on? And how do they already orient themselves, let's say, somewhere in, in the savannah or something? Well, you have to have depth cues. So uh, you need landmarks, you need some trees, so you need something sticking up. And and later on, of course, we have various uh, towers, which are, or they can be even uh, ugly buildings. They can be anything, but they are landmarks. So with this in mind, that is what people are looking for, and we can apply it to everything, including to IIT campus, which I have had students analyze, and even to Crown Hall. Uh, you know, but it's a little harder to find landmarks in Crown Hall because it's, one, it's a very big open space, actually. Uh, but one can apply it variously. And, and I think I don't have more time now, but uh, William White uh, is the one who uh, investigated how one can make New York City a livable city, because he found that after these modernist, um, uh, modern skyscrapers uh, uh, that were kind of growing up like mushrooms, we had, no, we had absolutely empty space on the street. And he said, we have to bring people to the street. This is a terrible thing. And he struck a deal with the city planners saying, if I can create spaces, if, if I can find out what brings people to, street, to the streets so we have city life, will you, uh, you know, rezone the city uh, uh, accordingly? And they, have, uh, they said yes, and he did so. And he, find, he found out exactly what attracts people, and what makes people happy, and what are the elements that work. So this can be studied, and I'm so happy because I'm a sociologist and I want to save the world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
So think about this room. If you widened any of the panels, you would then have to change them in some other way. If you made the columns bigger, if you touched any element in this room, it would affect the relationship of every other element in the room is, is the idea that's, that's uh, involved. If you were to walk, well, not quite next door, but almost into St. James Cathedral, the Episcopal Church at the corner, you'd find a Gothic piece of architecture, right? And, and Gothic architecture, me said, is like a sausage. You can cut it wherever you want. There was this, this, this long thing, and because it's essentially a section, a section through a building, it is not as dependent on the proportional relationships as Greek architecture is. And since we live in a world in which we like to divide things into this and that, good and bad, large and small, this kind of way of distinguishing architecture is another way of imagining oneself, placing oneself in the world. And having introduced that, I'd like to ask Eric and Stuart if they see architecture in a way that can be abstracted in that very dramatic kind of way, or since in your remarks, both of you talked about the particularity of spaces that you admire, that you try and create in your own work that moves you, is this kind of effort to make the strong distinctions something that is useful as a way of uh, making a claim, but is actually not very useful in, uh, the in the conduct of your practice. I think, I think if I had to arrive at sort of dual aspects of architecture that are opposing and fundamental, it might be buildings that are hermetic and orderly, hermetic and orderly unto themselves. They are sort of complete entities. Uh, they could exist in isolation or alongside other things. And then there are other things that are picturesque or additive and more informal. And both are very engaging, and I think both reveal their inherent characteristics in different ways. But I also think you can have hybrids. You can have uh, orderly hermetic buildings or components of a building that relate to one another in an informal way. Or you can have uh, informal buildings that, have, that are very highly ordered. And I don't, I don't know if that's so useful for this discussion. I would think just if, if I were considering a way forward, I would want to be able to uh, procure evidence so I would probably want to canvas buildings, not that are uh, idiosyncratic in an unknowable way or uh, amorphous, but that have clear characteristics and are broadly acknowledged as being successful models for how people feel in them. Or do they encourage the behaviors that they're intended to? Or do they encourage other behaviors, but they are successful because of that just by chance? I would want to find the most potent models and you know, that don't have a lot of peripheral noise around them and then consider how people respond, whatever kind of metrics you use, whether it's a survey or an MRI, how people respond to them. And I think if you were to come up with sort of an encyclopedic selection of these models, there, they would vary broadly in their characteristics, but I think highly ordered models, uh, the relationship between order and the way that you could measure a response to it would be a very clear beginning. But I think there are some buildings that, you know, I brought up Alvar Alto, or you think of like museum buildings that are like the Louisiana Museum in Copenhagen. They are really powerful places that people engage with and love, and they have a certain relationship both within, spatially, and to the environment around them. They are probably more difficult to study, but I think if you could unlock some kernel of their magic, it would be a useful didactic tool for architects, even if it's somewhat inconclusive, just to get architects to think of something outside of abstraction and formalism. And I'll just, I'll just 
conclude before I shut up. But my imaginative process is always imagining being in a space. And just as I might begin with some sort of planimetric or sculptural diagram, I always, personally, I always begin with sort of episodic views of how you might experience a building. And they might be uh, crude or vague, but that's always uh, a place of departure for me. And I think that was the allure of cinema for me as another creative enterprise in addition to architecture. Because I've always seen those kinds of unfolding experiences being closely related. And I think if architects are encouraged to think that way, because I think everybody attracted to architecture has that innate curiosity or love for experience and mystery or rightness. I think if that can be encouraged uh, in their education, it, it would be enormously beneficial uh, to the poor souls or lucky ones that have to use these buildings for decades on. Stuart? That's it. <laughs> you know, I think the distinctions that you made are useful, uh, but for me, uh, I don't look to them. I mean, in, in a more general sense, you're talking about classicism versus romanticism. And, and the characteristics that come with that, which are applicable to literature, music, as well as architecture, but they also have to do with ideas about composition, ordering, and how we experience things in a relational sense. Uh, the idea that romanticism looks to uh, the unique performance, the unique building, whereas classicism is thought of as um, something which is more uh, rural bound in terms of its ordering systems and is uh, repetitive and widely applicable. And for me, when I look at buildings or when I think about doing buildings, one of the things that I ask myself is, is what can I learn from all of those, from great examples of each of those kinds of buildings and then more importantly, when is that applicable? You know, uh, the, the, most, uh, the most important building in the city fabric historically were freestanding buildings. And historically, they were highly articulated, whether they were classical or romantic. Modern architecture, I think you could characterize in its uh, creation of form and insistence upon being freestanding within uh, the fabric of a city, or just freestanding as individual objects with space around them, is part of a romantic tradition. But the way I look at what there is to be learned from exemplars of each of those kinds of buildings has to do with um, what for me is, is often an initial kind of design decision, which is, what's the appropriate thing to do here? You know, should I be doing a building that as its primary gesture articulates or, or sort of beats you over the head with how it is different from its environment, surroundings, context, and adjacent buildings? Or am I in a situation where what I really should do is to defer to the design characteristics, scale, uh, and order of the area, environment, or site that I've been asked to build on. So in terms of the way I think about architecture initially as a designer, the way I think about architecture as somebody who studies architecture interested in uh, finding principles that have larger meaning and that can be incorporated into the work that uh, Julie and I do together, I don't find making those distinctions initially uh, useful. I think they're part of uh, a determination of what for us is a, is a meaningful starting point. And I think as designers, we're all looking for meaningful starting points. I mean, I, I early on figured out that the whole idea of functionalism as a determinant of architectural form really had to do with the dilemma of which 
I'm sure writers and musicians and many other, and certainly painters, deal with, which is facing a blank canvas. Where, where and how do you decide where to begin? And if that beginning point is one choice among many, it always has an arbitrary quality to it. And as human beings, we're really not equipped or capable of making arbitrary decisions. So that functionalism, the idea that you could take the buildings program, make a diagram of adjacencies, and then somehow turn that diagram into something that was architecture and that was, you know, worked exper experientially, uh, was, was really a fallacy. And I think that all of the new kinds of input which are really saying, hey, this is important, pay attention to it, whether it's in, you know, wh whether it's uh, the impact of the environment and the way in which buildings should recognize and, and be influenced by that, whether it's an idea, an ideas that are coming from neuroscience now about how we experience things and what that might mean for design decisions we're making. I think it's all part of a process where we are all trying to rationalize for ourselves a beginning point for the design decisions we make. Thank you, thank you very much. It's, I think, time for uh, the audience to ask questions of the panel if they wish. We have a couple of people on the perimeter with microphones so everyone can hear. There's a question just back here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, in, in the very building that we're in right now, you know, it has a vernacular and uh, just like a church. And, um, you know, it's, it's a building that's actually an auditorium. And so why did an architect use something that would cause you to feel like you're in a church or use a hushed voice like you're in a church uh, when it's not a church? And I can show you a building that looks just like this one. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll make it an attempt to answer, and that is, um, this was built for the American College of Surgeons, and it's my general experience that in the medical profession, surgeons kind of think they're like God. So the... <laughs> I won't disagree. <laughs> you won't disagree. I will not disagree. Well, the other it, physician it, up here says she won't respect. disagree. So, but I think you're, exa you're exactly right. You're in a centralized space. If you look at the plan, it's a Greek cross plan. There's a, a dome at the, over your head. This wall of chairs certainly looks like the chairs that bishops and the choir and other big deals in the church would sit in. So th that's very much the case. But there's some elements that kind of argue against it. The little balconies that are around the perimeter, the lower floor in the center des also describes the way you might organize a nightclub. And Ben Marshall, the architect, was very famous for the, uh, enjoying uh, the high life. So you've got other ways of reading the space than the, I think, dominant view, uh, which, is, uh, which is ecclesiastical. But Yeah, well, I mean, clearly most doctors think of what they do in those terms. But I think that the, the space is an architectural appropriation of what, for centuries, uh, we've understood as a place of assembly and gathering where if you want important kind of uh, proclamations or information was delivered to us. Well, and also, surely. A church. And, yeah. <laughs> well, but a church, but also um, if you look at places where people got together to decide things, they often had some kind of space in which people could face one another across a narrow gap, as in the British Parliament, or face one another around some kind yeah. of nearly concentric circle, uh, as in our uh, houses of uh, yeah. And the thing that comes to mind are uh, religions that actually, depending on the relationship of the congregant to the minister, to one another, and to God, really have used meeting houses as the form of a church rather than something which is more secularly derived from the history of, say, the Roman Catholic Church. Patricia or Uluka, would you like to comment on the ecclesiastical qualities of this interior? <laughs> oh, this, uh, but, oh, 
the church-like qualities of this well, interior. How does it make you feel to be in here? In here. Yeah. Uh, I, w I still want to complain about the acoustics. Yes, I can't hear that. <laughs> and uh, and one one uh, characteristic uh, characteristic of these uh, uh, spiritual feelings or something one gets is uh, uh, is the reverberation of uh, uh, and all the kind of interesting acoustical effects that you have some kind of muted uh, uh, existence, uh, muted things. It doesn't happen here. Also, I don't think it's tall enough. So I don't can't quite get the feeling here, but I consider it a very uh, uh, opulent place and a kind of place that induces respect. It's a different kind of feeling that I get in a church-like environment. But I can tell you that I, had, I asked uh, my students in a midterm recently to analyze Crown Hall and you know, for various kinds of feelings and uh, impressions and going through all our literature and so on. And I got a few people who said that they felt all like in a church in Crown Hall. And it has partially, partially to do exactly with the sound, which they found was kind of sometimes muted or a little like being in a museum, a very strange thing, but that is what some students said. And, and it is tall and it is, uh, uh, I think it has same, uh, something similar to the experience you can find in that Thorn Crown uh, Chapel uh, in the Ozark Mountains that is so much discussed, the one small chapel that is out there in the, in the woods where you kind of have, have a feeling of awe because of the flickering of, of light or the changing, uh, changing light over the day and also some kind of dark m m murmur from the forest. Uh, and it's something similar to Crown Hall also a little there. So yes, there are places, but not this one. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, it's, it's so interesting because um, it's, a, it's a wonderful space to be in tonight, but then I think, could I live in this space? Um, so much of what we're talking about are monumental type buildings or um, grand buildings. And uh, we don't really have to address what's it like to spend most of your life in this building? Because you don't spend most of your life in these types of buildings. Um, but do we think enough about what are the buildings like that we actually spend all of our time in? Um, you know, um, when we talk about nature, bringing nature in, that that's pleasing to people and you can do that in architecture or natural light, but how, how much does that translate into the buildings that we spend uh, all of our time in? There seems almost to be a little bit of a disconnect between um, the way we think about buildings like this and then what we're actually in most of the time. And, um, that's very important because I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, the field of epigenetics. And what that is is um, what we experience changes us, and that is actually something that can be inherited by our offspring. Um, and it's not in our DNA. It's not in, in um, the genes. We actually, there actually are things that get inherited that are not in our genes. Um, and so the way we're experiencing things has, has even more implications than just for ourselves. You know, what does it mean for okay. our future? I want to ask you an architectural question. Uh, I mean, clearly this is so different from what anybody envisions as a house or a place to live in. But if you had to spend the night here, where would you set up your bed and why? Here? Yeah, if you had to spend the night um, in this space, okay. where, where would you okay. want to be? Yeah. Or what, what, I can, what would position you in some place where you might you. be comfortable? I think I can tell you. I would go up there yeah. to the balcony yeah. all said that. because yeah. it's cozier. <laughs> and it's more protected. You can uh, see people coming to attack you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's right. And you know that looks very uncomfortable no, no, back there. Up here. Um, I, but the uh, I go to the balcony. Is I don't really see this as a church-like space. I think it has a lot of characteristics of a church, or like the Greek model of the ecclesiasterion, or an amphitheater. But I see it more as kind of an opera house than yeah, exactly. a church. Mm -hmm. And I've been in yeah. this space yeah. both for 
uh, presentations, which are highly directional and focused, which is similar to, you know, preaching or a church where you have a uh, focus on an individual or a number of individuals or an orchestra, which seems appropriate to those kinds of presentations. But I've also been in here for parties or dinners. Oh. And uh, it's a fabulous space for that as well. So I, I think it does serve dual purposes nicely. And I think it's a little bit more exuberant. Well, it depends. There are some churches that are very exuberant. Baltazar Neumann or question at the back here. Uh, thank you. I'm going to try to project here. Um, this question is probably shaped more toward the architecture, certainly uh, for the sociologists that this is how Terry jumped in. Uh, to borrow a phrase from Professor Cohen uh, from another panel, this, this space can certainly present uh, several different spatial propositions, right, that are, that are a result of us, uh, that you are know a result what? I of can hear you perfectly. and. But I think the maybe everybody else can. On the stage, is that we're all amplified? Can, you, can, you, can everybody hear it? No. Oh, no. okay. Then <laughs> is that is this better? Can you can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, so so as we perceive this space uh, as we stand here, but. It, it starts to beg the question for me is as we talk about perception as we stand here in three dimensions and how we, our, 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 co our, our ability to perceive and assimilate the space, how important is plan anymore? Is, is the importance of plan to the idea of where you start, is it diminished as a result of these discussions or is it enhanced uh, even more? I always see the plan as the genesis, but I think it's inextricably linked to appearance and form and material and uh, your, your spatial perception, how you perceive a building, how you feel in a building, what its scale is, and how does it either draw you to a single place or lead you on a meander. I don't, I don't, I find them inseparable, but I think the plan is a very useful tool in the process of design to keep referring to. I wouldn't say that you can start with one component of architectural design exclusive of all the others. I don't think it works that way. I mean, you could, but I don't know what you'd yeah. end up with. Well, you, Eric, you called the plan the genesis. Uh, the famous oh, the gen pronouncement yeah. is the plan is the generator. Yeah which is both with Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright. I don't know what, what Mies said about the plan. The interesting thing is that at a certain point, as designers developmentally, making plan has embedded in it an idea of the space, but I don't think that that's kind of immediate for most people as they learn to visualize and to think about design, and I remember specifically uh, school problems that we had where we were forced to solve the building in section because of the site or because of some of the parameters of the program. And uh, thinking back on it, I think that was a brilliant strategy to force us to think in three dimension and I th dimensions. And I think uh, the quality of architecture out there would bear this out, but I think that most architects think only in plan and never see or visualize the space that they're creating. Hmm. <laughs> that's a problem. Well, now that that's was, a good, that was mean, imagine. but <laughs> I so, believe it true. I was reading this wonderful book called The Mind in Architecture, and they talked about a housing uh, project in the, in the Bronx where they started not with a plan but with the users. And I would argue for doing that more. Um, because that, what they what they predate ever putting pen to paper. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so <laughs> when they but the the thing was when they asked the the residents what they wanted, they said they wanted a healthy uh, project. They wanted it to be healthy, and um, so you know uh, the World Health Organization. Uh, defines health as physical, mental, and social well-being. You know, maybe that should be the plan. 
But to <laughs> that get, would be the start. How do you get from that to architecture except by well, saying, that's your job. okay, all right, well, yeah, but if somebody <laughs> says healthy to me, and Eric, please weigh in on this, yeah. uh, I think lots, lots of natural light, yeah. connection to the outdoors, uh, access to the outdoors, uh, sense, of, sense of spaciousness, and sense of repose. Um, and I know how to think I know how to do that architecturally. And I also think the origins of architecture before you start planning, or maybe it's a reciprocal process, is always what is the purpose of this building? Who uses it? What does mm -hmm. my client want? Mm -hmm. Do they want uh, comfort and repose? Do they want uh, self aggrandizement? Mm -hmm. Do they want eternity, yeah. eternity? Or do they want something? more casual. That you start with before you begin to think of how that might manifest itself mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. architecture. And then there's always a reciprocal relationship between those wishes and needs and the genesis of the building. But I, may I say something? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I thought that this, uh, uh, this question already has been answered uh, formally through something called biophilic design, which of course is a grab bag, sorry, sorry. biophilic design, yeah, yeah. which of course is a grab bag of all kinds of various approaches, including big windows. That's not so biophilic, it's just big windows. Uh, but there are lots of other aspects. And then all these therapeutic uh, uh, books now about therapeutic uh, environments and so on. And you probably know a lot about it, uh, Patricia. Uh, this kind of therapeutic design and stuff, because after it was found, that actually it is extremely um, benefiting for health to, to have nature, incorporate nature somehow, or even elements of nature in hospitals and in various kinds of places, and also in workplaces. I mean, everybody knows this. Hasn't it be become more formalized now? So therefore, it's like not like what can we do, but maybe there are even guides these days. I mean, there is this book that I have bought maybe 10 years ago, biophilic design, where there are lots and lots and lots of suggestions this way and that way. But they are not really formalized for, by architects. But, but it is now an industry, I think. And you have to say it's sustainable, it's biophilic, and stuff. People want that. Or what? I'm afraid that we're out of time. So thank you all. Thank you all for your attention. And I hope that it's still a very nice fall evening outside for your walk home. Bye-bye. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you for coming. I just have a couple of closing remarks. Um, I believe that our guests and the panelists have offered tremendous insights tonight that deepen our understanding of the power of architectural vocabulary. We're discovering that we can affect our environments and our environments restructure our cognitive abilities and outlooks. This inquiry can and should sharpen our mind to reflect on our own lives and our world. I have a few questions myself. Don't have to answer now. Um, do these two structures that we talked about tonight, through their use of language of architecture, reflect an extra temporal vision that led to their creation? How do they each reflect a collective belief in the individual sense of humanity within the context of their times. Could it be that our internal rhythms drive us to see these relationships between the architectural elements? And finally, is it the biological, neurological, emotional makeup of the individual or the collective group consciousness that shapes the experience and begins a rethinking of our approaches and behaviors? As a result of these questions and this evening, we are interested in organizing a multidisciplinary project relating back to recent discoveries within these biological and related sciences. This effort to inspire has exciting practical ramifications 
in providing evidence for the design of perhaps better health care facilities, educational facilities, and the like, and homes, Patricia. Our hope is that we can, I, by the way, Patricia and I have worked together in the past. Our hope is that we can identify principles backing up those intuitions and the training that architects received that are deeply rooted in knowledge about how the brain works. For architects, it might mean creating a certification that would ensure a building followed brain-based principles of design in the same way that LEED certified buildings conform to the best environmentally uh, based practices. From ancient times, architecture has combined the aesthetic, the pragmatic, and a sense that some might call spiritual, the notion that we feel more in harmony with certain spaces than others. Classical Greek architecture established the golden mean, a ratio that renders structures from the Parthenon to Venice's St. Mark's Basilica to Mises Crown Hall especially pleasing. It's funny that, Eric, you mentioned opera and this building. I have a quote to conclude by Charles Garnier, one of my favorites, and the architect of the Palais Garnier in Paris, as he, before he approached, or as he approached, I should say, the design of that magnificent theater in the mid-19th century. He said, if instead of banal scenes and insignificant dialogue, we have agreeable sights and sounds of elevated speeches, the pleasure doubles and our benefit grows. So to that, we thank Mr. Richard Driehaus, the Driehaus Foundation and Museum for continuing his preservation efforts and advocacy of the importance of classical architecture, to ANFA, the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture, for their amazing efforts to connect architecture and neuroscience, the AIA Chicago for their continued guidance and support, to the Mies Society for efforts to preserve and further ideas and buildings that can serve society, to Anne Lazar, Fred Marks, Kevin Harrington, Stuart Cohen, Eric Lasher, Ulika Segerstrel, Patricia Normand, our panel, for elevated speeches, and you, our audience, for participating and being here tonight in this monumental space certainly not banal, and most certainly an agreeable site, the Driehaus Murphy Auditorium. Thank you very much.